Remember these? Von Dutch was iconic for Y2K fashion. Trucker caps, jeans, jackets. That was like our uniform, basically. They didn't know how to run a business. It was really a facade. It was really a facade. At its peak, Von Dutch went from minus $1,065,200 in sales to $150 million in six months' time. But in order to get there, many people had to get thrown under the bus. Behind the shimmering facade of celebrity endorsements and red carpet glamour actually lies a really sinister story involving everything from selling out to creative talent twisted by greed, shameless opportunism, sabotage, betrayal, and even murder. In a hyper-commercialized world where every single one of us is increasingly being pressured to package ourselves into commodifiable personal brands, the rise and fall of Von Dutch serves as a relevant reminder of a few timeless truths. There are consequences to excess. Authenticity, integrity, and staying true to your roots are often the key to longevity. Hype, for the most part, is unsustainable. And finally, if in order to win, you've been moving kind of funny and stepping on people's toes, karma will eventually come to find you. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Ann Darla, but you can call me AD. Today's deep dive will be my interpretation of the fascinating story of Von Dutch as described in the Hulu documentary, The Curse of Von Dutch, A Brand to Die For, directed by Andrew Renzi. This is a fan-made cover song, if you will, but make it a cover video. So without further ado, let's take a little time machine back to 1989, Venice Beach, California, birthplace of a creative visionary called Mike Cassell and his underground surf slash skate brand called The Bronze Age. In the 1990s, Venice Beach was a lot different than it was today. People could actually afford to live there. Before the tech industry came to town in the early 2000s and drove up real estate prices, cheap rents and the beach had previously attracted a very different subset of the American population. We're talking artists, writers, hippies, punks, uh, to what was once a down and out beach resort town. The old Venice Beach, as described by the people who lived there, was a sweet bohemian place where the unhoused were an integral part of the community. You could be who you want and you could be what you want. And that freedom led to magic. Venice Beach would morph into an epicenter of counterculture, not only in California, but throughout the world. The impact of what happened in this small town was international and was intergenerational. This is where bands like The Doors, Suicidal Tendencies, and Jane's Addiction were formed. It also became one of the birthplaces of modern competitive skateboarding. This is where the legendary Zephyr skateboarding team, AKA the Lords of Dogtown got their start and revolutionized the sport. But unfortunately, there was also a dark side to the magic. In the 1980s, the crack epidemic had ravaged Los Angeles. By the 1990s, local gangs like the Shoreline Crips and the Venice 13 were engaged in a fierce battle over crack cocaine sales territories. Venice Beach became plagued with gang activity and gang violence. It's in this explosive landscape that a man called Mike Cassell came of age and eventually would make a name for himself in the neighborhood as a bit of a gangster. The demographic makeup of Venice Beach has always been predominantly white. Based on my research, Asians made slash make up less than 5% of the population. So Mike Cassell stood out like a sore thumb, not only because he was a short king, but primarily because he was Asian. This led him to become heavily outcasted in the community. As a result, Mike Cassell developed the kind of unique perspective that could not only fuel creativity, but also criminality. In my opinion, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. In the Hulu documentary, Mike Cassell goes, quote, everyone comes to a point in life where they pick a path and either go full on conformist or become more of an outlaw. Mike Cassell became an outlaw. He got his start selling weed. Then he met a girl whose mother was connected to the Escobar family and leveled up to cocaine. Mike Cassell was definitely a little flashy with his wealth. His license plate at the time read for Indica on it, but he wasn't stupid. He wasn't that stupid. He knew that dealing drugs had an expiration date on it. So he needed to figure out a way to transition out of the drug business and become legitimate. That's how Mike Cassell would come up with the idea for the company that from my perspective would lay the foundation for Von Dutch, the underground surf slash skate brand called the Bronze Age. Modern popular surfing is predominantly a white boy sport. 
and the fashion at the time embodied that. 90s surf fashion was tight, colorful, happy. I'd go as far as to describe it as even a little metrosexual. 90s surf fashion was very obviously not a uniform made by or for people who've been othered, marginalized, or had it hard in life. Also from a female's perspective, I don't think surfer chicks actually look like this. If you're really out there in the elements all day, Okay, you're way more muscular, your skin is sun damaged, and you're not wearing that much makeup. So Mike Cassell, being not only a visible minority, but a gangster and a surfer, took a look at the market and didn't identify with any of the fashion available to people like him at the time. So he'd use the money he made off of drugs to create the kind of clothing brand he'd want to wear. The Bronze Age was noticeably edgier and harder than anything out at the time. To me, just the name alone evokes this kind of like gritty, primal, red-blooded masculinity, okay? <laughs> It's not Billabong, it's not Quicksilver, it's not the Body Glove, it's the Bronze Age. And when you pair that with the brand's iconic Demon Fishbone logo and streetwear inspired baggy fashion, this is very clearly a brand for the kind of men that go out there, hunt the bison, and proceed to eat the bones. Ultimately, the brand's backstory would only add to its street credibility. Before the Bronze Age transitioned into a legitimate clothing company, I don't know if it ever really did. For a long time, the company was a money laundering front for drugs. As well, Mike Cassell for at least four years ran the brand from San Quentin prison after he got busted dealing cocaine and the art designs would be literally made by convicts. So the Bronze Age would make some waves in the underground and eventually catch the attention and obsession of a young man called Bobby Vaughn. Bobby Vaughn also had a tumultuous childhood where he struggled to fit in. He was of Mexican Japanese descent, adopted by a white family and raised in Venice Beach, which, as I mentioned before, was dominated by white people. Like Cassell, he found surfing early on, but quickly realized that the fashion and culture weren't made for people like him. In the Hulu documentary, he mentions that the popular brands of the era basically made clothes for pussies, and Bobby Vaughn was not a pussy. In fact, Bobby Vaughn came of age in and around hardened criminals. As a kid, he became close with a young man called Mark Revis, whose entire family were gangbangers associated with the West Side Gang. In 1994 alone, Mark's older brother Hector had been sentenced to 15 years in prison for shooting two California Highway Patrol officers. And his older brother Jake had been a victim of a shooting at an arcade on the West Side. He'd survive. The Rivas family would take Bobby under its wing, and through them, he would acquire his first gun, a 25 millimeter chrome. One night in 1993, Bobby and Mark hit up a high school party in the parking lot of a Burger King on Soquel Avenue in Santa Cruz, California. Bobby Vaughn had tried to sell his gun earlier that day to some kid who had heard he had access to guns, but the sale fell through, and as a result, he brought the 25 millimeter chrome with him to the party. At the party, he'd make a rookie mistake. He'd shoot the gun off by accident while it was still in his pocket. The bullets didn't hurt anybody, but Mark Revis was alarmed and asked for the gun back. A couple minutes after this, an Astro van would pull up at the party. A bunch of guys would come out of the van. Mark Revis, who was associated with the West Side Gang, seemed to think that the attackers were from another gang located at the Villa San Carlos apartment complex. I'm not sure if these guys were rivals or not. Regardless, the dramatic scene results in a big ass fight. 40s are being flung at people's heads and at some point, Mark Revis pulls out the gun. He proceeds to fire two shots and murders a 19 year old man called Nelson Lange with the bullets. After this incident, Mark and Bobby make a hasty exit. The following day, they hop into a hatchback Honda Civic and drive Mark Rivas to Mexico, where he'd go on the run from law enforcement. Seven months later, Mark Rivas would turn himself in and eventually be convicted with first degree murder and sentenced as a minor with the California Youth Authority. It's unclear when he was released, but the maximum sentence was until age 25. And when Mark Rivas had been incarcerated, he was more or less 18, in and around the age of 18. So this event is obviously traumatic for Bobby Vaughn, but Mark's incarceration provided a short window of opportunity for Bobby to distance himself from the negative influences in his life and pick a different path. So he decides to channel his unbridled energy into surfing. Simultaneously, he keeps thinking about this brand called the Bronze Age that he had been wearing since he was 12 years old. He had grown to become a true cult follower slash fan of the brand and decides that he wants to 
to represent it. So one day he just boldly walks into the Bronze Age offices and asks Mike Cassell for a job. Mike Cassell at first was skeptical, but eventually Bobby would prove his worth. Not only was Bobby a talented surfer, but he also had a great look. He was attractive, but he also had that hardness the Bronze Age was looking for. Cassell takes Bobby under his wing. Bobby Vaughn would end up moving in with Mike Cassell and Cassell's then girlfriend Janelle. Mike Cassell was 15 years older than Bobby, so he'd eventually evolve into a kind of father figure for him. The trio would literally become family. Unfortunately, uh, as Bobby and many of the people who'd work with Cassell would eventually come to realize, Mike Cassell was not the most business-minded individual. In fact, a photographer called John Bagel Classman in the Hulu documentary describes Mike Cassell in the following way. Quote, Mike Cassell absolutely had a very strange Midas touch where everything he touched turned into gold and then two seconds later, it turned into a big pile of shit. That's exactly what happened with the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age had grown to generate a decent amount of sales for an underground garage brand, something like north of a million dollars. They were getting better press, better distribution, and all this caught the attention of a rich businessman called Irving Cass. Irving Cass at the time was a partner with the popular brand Skechers and the retailer JCPenney. Irving Cass approached Cassell wanting to partner up. Mike Cassell would agree to a partnership. He'd proceed to sign a deal with Irving Cass, failed to read the fine print, and get played. Irving Cass would buy the Bronze Age for the goodwill discount of $35,000, which basically only equated to the value of the inventory they had on hand and didn't take into consideration things like trademark. Then Irving Cass hired Mike Cassell to work for the Bronze Age and fired him. Shortly after this, Cass would file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and that's the end of the Bronze Age. Much like the journalist Andrew Callahan when he got fired from his YouTube channel, All Gas No Breaks. I made a video about that, check it out. Mike Cassell was left with nothing but clout. But as we all know, clout is something that can evaporate quickly. If you want to capitalize off of clout, you need to move fast. So Bobby Vaughn and Mike Cassell would go on the prowl for their next business opportunity. This hunt would lead them to the 1996 ASR trade show in San Diego, California. This is where they cross paths with a man called Ed Boswell and the Von Dutch we know today would resurrect. The ASR trade show, also known as the Action Sports Retailer Trade Show, was one of the biggest action sports trade shows on the West Coast. Up until the 2008 economic recession would lead to its demise, every year, twice a year, for 29 years, hundreds of surf, skate, moto, and snowboarding brands would gather at the San Diego Convention Center for a few days of business and pleasure. The trade show was legendary for its after parties, but also for the networking opportunity it presented people in the industry. In this one room, thousands of retail buyers could connect with brands and make deals for the following year. Brands could connect with publishers, photographers, creatives, and pro athletes. Pro athletes and up and coming talent could try to secure sponsorships or get discovered. And all that was fueled by things like free booze and hot girls in and around the boots. Fun fact, in my younger years, I was once a traveling promo girl for a cartooning company. And my literal job was to look hot and lure men into the trade show booths so uh, salespeople and specialists could talk to them about the product. So obviously, this would be the perfect place for Bobby Vaughn and Mike Cassell to figure out their next move. And it would be at the 1996 ASR trade show that Bobby and Mike would come across a booth that catches their attention. And not because it had hot girls, but rather because it would be decorated with the graphics and designs of a legendary artist Mike Cassell would immediately recognize as the work of Kenneth Von Dutch. Kenneth Robert Howard, also known as Dutch, Von Dutch, or JL Bax, Joe Lunchbox, was an American motorcycle mechanic, artist, pinstripe, striper, metal fabricator, knife maker, and gunsmith. Von Dutch was a major influence on the customizing of vehicles from the 1950s onward. Among many motorcycle enthusiasts, he's known as one of the fathers of what is referred to as custom culture. In fact, the K in custom was created by Von Dutch as a nod to his special affection let's just call it special affection, for German aesthetics. If you don't know who he is, you may still be familiar with his work. He created the famous flying eyeball logo, the custom Kenford truck, and the special pearlescent color known as candy apple red he used to paint Marilyn Monroe's car. This is a color that some manufacturers still offer to motor vehicles today. He once wrote a famous manifesto that proclaimed that nothing was original and copyrights and patents were mostly ego trips and he boldly encouraged people to use his art 
I can only assume for free in any way they wanted to. Kenneth Howard was many things, including a alcoholic, which ultimately led to his death, but a pussy in the traditional masculine sense, at least was not one of them. Von Dutch was daring and he was hard. It's no surprise to me then that Bobby Vaughn and Mike Cassell got excited and inspired by what they saw in the booth. But in order to access the goods, they need to go through a gatekeeper. A man called Ed Boswell had acquired the master licensing rights to Vaughn Dutch from Kenneth Howard's daughters. He was the one manning the booth that year at ASR. According to Mike Cassell, the only thing Ed Boswell was making with the rights at the time were patches and mechanic shirts with the signature eyeball. Mike Cassell saw the potential for something bigger, but in order to do anything with Von Dutch, he'd need Ed. So for a short moment, the three men joined forces and in and around 1997, they started working on a project called Von Dutch Originals. The initial vision for Von Dutch Originals, which from my perspective can be attributed to the creative sensibilities of Mike Cassell was to create the next big American denim line, something like Wrangler or Levi's. As described by the New York Times, Von Dutch Originals would set out to create a brand that turned working class signifiers into markers of cool. The whole thing would be derived from military history, working with rigid denims and tough materials, and resurrecting through fashion the rebellious punk rock spirit of Kenneth Von Dutch. In fact, wait a second, there we go. In fact, the first elements of production for Von Dutch originals were stolen. Von Dutch started by taking the label, started by taking the label off of Dickie's jeans and selling it as their own. The working dynamic between the three men must have been interesting. The way I see it, Ed Boswell is the guy with the rights, Mike Cassell is the designer, the one with the creative vision, and Bobby Vaughn is the marketer, the guy on the ground pushing the product and building relationships. Upon the creation of Von Dutch Originals, Mike Cassell's only marching orders to Bobby Vaughn would be to go out there and hustle. Simultaneously, Bobby Vaughn just welcomed his first child, Elijah, with the 19-year-old actress slash model called Ellie Jane, who also happens to struggle with crystal meth addiction and postpartum depression. So the stakes in Bobby Vaughn's personal life have been raised. He's suddenly under pressure to provide. He's hungry and hustling is exactly what Bobby Vaughn goes out to do. From my perspective, it would be Bobby Vaughn's hustling that would get Von Dutch Originals its first real results. And that would be the serendipitous manufacturing of its first viral moment, MTV Cribs. Los Angeles, California, to this day, remains one of the primary epicenters of social climbing around the world. And I don't necessarily mean this in a bad way. In Los Angeles, if you're cool, attractive, good at connecting the dots, setting a mark and hitting the target, you can easily wiggle your way into almost any room. And Bobby Vaughn wiggled his way into rooms. So somehow, Bobby Vaughn would become acquainted with a man called Jerry Anderson. Jerry Anderson just so happened to be Pamela Anderson's brother. Pamela Anderson at the time was one of the biggest stars in the world. Bobby would play it smart, nurture the relationship, and next thing you know, he meets Pamela Anderson in the trailer of her then reality show, VIP. Bobby Vaughn just so happens to have Von Dutch gear on him. He gets her to try it on. She loves it. And shortly after that, she puts him in contact with her ex, the rock star Tommy Lee. While Pamela Anderson would have been a great look for the brand, Tommy Lee was an even better one. Tommy Lee is an American musician who co-founded and played drums for the heavy metal band Motley Crue. He was a rock star, a playboy, heavily tattooed, had problems with the law, which at the time included domestic violence, and he had just sold the masters to his albums for approximately $70 million. So he was also filthy rich. Tommy Lee and Bobby Vaughn become social acquaintances. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, the nail the nails are slay. I know the nails are slay. One day, Bobby Vaughn is hanging out at Tommy Lee's infamous Tommy Land mansion and ding dong, the doorbell rings. Tommy Land was Lee's version of the Playboy Mansion where one could just party with girls all day and etc. Tommy Lee is fast asleep. Everyone else in the house is partying, so Bobby decides to get the door. 
At the door, a woman called Nina introduces herself and tells Bobby that she's here with her crew scheduled to film an episode of the legendary TV show MTV Cribs and like they need to start filming now. The whole thing must have caught Bobby Vaughn off guard, but like a true guerrilla marketer, he was prepared because he just so happened to have Von Dutch gear on hand. When Tommy Lee starts filming the episode, he's like in a random t-shirt. But at some point, uh, Bobby senses an opportunity to seize the moment via, I'm assuming, some of the trust he had built with Tommy Lee and hands him some Von Dutch gear. He proceeds to tell him, you need to rock this shit right now. Tommy Lee agrees. Bobby Vaughn also hands Von Dutch gear to the girls, but for some reason in the episode, the logo's blurred out on the girls. Either way, when the now legendary episode of MTV Cribs aired on October 25th, 2000, people around the world were basically like, what's Von Dutch? The MTV Cribs episode became the brand's first major product placement moment and earned them some much needed hype. On the surface, at least, it seemed like things were finally starting to happen. They've got a bit of buzz, they've got some clout, and that seemed to have created a pressure to keep up with the appearance of success, which as we all know, is a slippery slope. Without any significant sales to justify these kinds of expenses, Mike Cassell would do things like give a ton of merch away for free, throw lavish parties, or invest in a $60,000 prime booth at the Magic Trade Show. But at the time, it's like all style, no substance because they're basically living off credit. Ellie Jane, Bobby Vaughn's girlfriend at the time, had inherited SPX shares in the stock market from her grandfather and sells that to help Von Dutch. Ellie Jane's mom would also offer them a American Express credit card, but all that does is dig them deeper into debt. Under Mike Cassell's leadership and lack of business acumen, Von Dutch was headed into a pretty unsustainable direction. So it became obvious that they need an investor and they need cash quickly. Simultaneously, Ed Boswell and Mike Cassell start butting heads. There had been tension between them from the start. Their creative visions for the brand deferred early on. Ed Boswell had always wanted to keep things simple by selling patches and t-shirts, while Mike Cassell had bigger dreams. This would lead to some infighting and eventually Ed Boswell got cut out of the picture. The details around Ed Boswell getting cut out of Von Dutch aren't clear. It seems like Ed Boswell owned the master license and was promised 1% of net sales from Von Dutch and that Mike and co refused to pay him. Mike Cassell rebuffs this. He claims to have nothing to do with cutting Ed out of the picture. Bobby Vaughn and Mike's brother Donald say otherwise. They both insinuated that Mike Cassell pretty much sabotaged the relationship with Ed Boswell on purpose because he just needed him out of the picture to level up. And the man who'd eventually step in to fill the void left by Ed Boswell and bring Von Dutch to the next level was a cold-hearted Danish businessman called Tony Sorensen. But worry not, Ed Boswell would eventually get his revenge. Tony Sorensen is a Danish martial arts champion who moved to America to start in low budget action movies. His film career didn't take off, but he did manage to score himself a rich Brazilian wife. This gave Tony Sorensen the financial freedom to indulge in entrepreneurial endeavors and Cadillacs. A couple of months before we rang in the year 2000, Tony Sorensen had visited a auto body shop owned by a guy called Ted at the shop, Tony Sorensen sees some Von Dutch gear lying around and the brand's counterculture image immediately sparks his interest. Ted offers to connect Tony Sorensen with Mike Cassell. The two would eventually meet at a In-N-Out burger and the next thing you know, their respective families are vacationing together in Mexico. Tony Sorensen's expressed interest in the brand along with his deep pockets would kickstart a hard and fast relationship between him and Mike Cassell. But Bobby Vaughn is skeptical. He can clearly see that the two connected over Von Dutch and Von Dutch is a business. He's happy Mike Cassell has a new friend, but he's eager to know what Tony Sorensen wants out of the relationship from a business standpoint. He's worried that Mike Cassell may be infatuated with Tony and not thinking rationally. But Mike Cassell's mindset at the time was that everything would just magically work itself out and like nothing to worry about. So Tony Sorensen invests close to a million dollars into Von Dutch. In turn, with that money, he buys 51% of the company and becomes CEO. The only problem is that Von Dutch at that point wasn't really a company. They had no infrastructure, no distribution, and abysmal sales. We're talking days with no sales and days with $200 sales. So one of the first thing Tony Sorensen does is try to get some corporate structure in with the long-term goal of taking Von Dutch out of the garage and into a office. He names Mike Cassell as the creative director. In the beginning, there's 
there's no Mike Cassell without Bobby Vaughn. In Tony Sorensen's own words, they were a package deal. So he puts Bobby in a guerrilla marketing role. He also hires this guy called Niels Jewell and this woman called Carolyn Rothwell, who both have no recollection of meeting Bobby Vaughn during this time, which is quite telling. From what I understand, Bobby Vaughn's role would be similar to what it had previously been. He'd be tasked with guerrilla marketing to basically hustle and be out there in the street pushing products and building relationships. However, while he's out doing that, him and Mike Cassell fall out of contact and Mike Cassell and Tony Sorensen grow closer. Bobby Vaughn at first is not too worried about this because he trusts his brother, Mike Cassell. Then quite suddenly, someone from Bobby's past would make a reappearance. Bobby Vaughn's old friend, Mark Revis, is released from prison. Bobby Vaughn would invite Mark Revis to come live with him and his girlfriend, Ellie Jane, and their son, Elijah. This would be quite convenient because during this time, Ellie Jane would relapse back into drugs and Mark Revis is in a position to step in as a parent figure to help Bobby raise his son, Elijah. I honestly think that all of these compounding factors, including a lingering guilty conscience over Mark's incarceration, would lead Bobby Vaughn to feel like he owed it to Mark Revis to help him get back on his feet with whatever opportunities he had available to him. At the time, the only thing Bobby Vaughn had to offer Mark Revis would be Von Dutch. So irregardless of whether or not this was a smart business decision for the company, Bobby Vaughn would try to wiggle Mark Revis into the picture. It doesn't work. Mark Revis moved like a gangster and it raises alarm bells for everyone. Tony Sorensen starts to see Mark Revis as a liability and Bobby Vaughn is the one who brought Mark Revis in. So that doesn't speak too highly about about his judgment. As well, the pair are now clearly a codependent package deal, kind of like Bobby Vaughn and Mike Cassell were when Tony Sorensen came in. So Tony Sorensen comes to the conclusion that he needs to get rid of Bobby Vaughn. But from my perspective, it doesn't seem like Tony Sorensen has the balls to actually tell Bobby Vaughn and Mark Revis that to their faces. Instead, he'd opt for the snake move of shielding his shadiness behind the legalese of a bad contract. Bobby Vaughn, without legal representation and without properly reading the contract, signs it and gets played. So Tony Sorensen's maneuver would be to approach Bobby Vaughn with an idea. He'd pitch to Bobby Vaughn the juicy carrot of being able to manage his own exclusive subdivision of the Von Dutch brand. Unrelated to denim, Bobby Vaughn would not be allowed to work on denim. From what I understand, Bobby Vaughn, as part of this deal, would also get access to money up front. But for this opportunity to be available to him, he'd need to sign a contract. The shady ass contract Bobby Vaughn agreed to essentially turned him into a licensee of the company. It also made him sign over his 20% ownership in exchange for something like 10K. Bobby Vaughn in the Hulu documentary states that he was, quote, sauced for 10K. Next thing you know, Bobby Vaughn is terminated by Tony Sorensen and left unemployed. His best friend, brother, and father figure, Mike Cassell, nowhere to be found. In hindsight, Mike Cassell does feel some sense of responsibility for making promises to Bobby Vaughn he did not keep and leaving him with nothing. But at the same time, Mike Cassell claims that Bobby Vaughn was doing the one thing he agreed to not do as part of his contract, which was working on denim. So from a legal perspective, his termination was justified. I guess this is a case of like, sorry, not sorry, but you kind of asked for it. Once Bobby Vaughn realizes what hit him, he and Mark Revis grow furious. Bobby's first instinct is to pull up on these guys and quote, chalk it up. But Mark Revis, surprisingly, is the one that's like, no, calm down. We'll find a way to make things right. Only Mark Revis's idea of making things right would be to set a trap for Mike Cassell where he'd be intimidated under duress into agreeing to signing back over the rights to Bobby Vaughn. Mark Revis and Bobby Vaughn would invite Mike Cassell over to a store in Venice Beach called Slave. Mike Cassell would be welcomed by guns and men wearing bandanas who are telling Cassell that he needs to sign over the rights or they'll chalk it up, which my middle class ass just discovered was coded language for murder. Bobby Vaughn in the film claims that this act of intimidation never happened and he was never there. But at the end of the day, what's the big deal? Mike Cassell, quote, got out alive, right? Mike Cassell is obviously aghast. I always think of Ice Spice when I say that word. But under duress and the alleged threat of murder, he makes a verbal agreement with Mark and allegedly Bobby to sign back over the rights. So the trio would set up a second meeting at a Johnny Rockets near the Von Dutch Melrose offices to sign the physical contract. But once they get there, the whole thing grinds to a halt. As Bobby Vaughn starts opening his briefcase, the sky is swarmed by helicopters and police storm into the restaurant detaining all three men. Someone had called the police with the tip that there was a murder about to take place. Guess who the mole was? Janelle. 
Mike Cassell's girlfriend. Janelle had heard about the first meeting at Slave and was so scared that Mike was walking himself into another trap that in an attempt to save her man and Bobby, allegedly, from getting she would sabotage the whole deal. When the cops failed to find any weapons and eventually came to the conclusion that, you know, it was a false alarm and nobody was getting murdered today, uh, the vibes were off and the meeting was over. <laughs> Mike Cassell at the time thinks that Bobby Vaughn's the one who called the cops and uh, it would only be upon the filming of the Hulu documentary that he discovered that it was his own ex-girlfriend Janelle. So basically, you know, as a result of this scene, Bobby Vaughn loses his last opportunity to get his shares back and is permanently cut out of the picture. Uh, what's funny is that in this story, every time someone is cut out, someone new is in. The man who'd be brought in would be a French designer called Christian Odigier. Christian Odigier was a talented denim designer who was recommended to the company by Mike Cassell, out of all people. Following Bobby Vaughn's departure, Von Dutch was still not doing well financially, and they were in desperate need of a hip product. Tony Sorensen had liked the designs he'd seen from Christian Odige and would challenge him to a three-month trial with the brand. Odige would pump out like a sick collection in two weeks and prove his worth. Tony Sorensen's dream at this point was not only to get out of the garage, but also to get into the denim bar of retailers like Fred Siegel's. Christian Odige shares this commercial commercialized fashion dream with Sorensen. Tony Sorensen and Christian Odige start getting close and Mike Cassell's alarm bells start to ring. First of all, Mike Cassell vehemently disagreed with taking Von Dutch in this direction. He wanted the brand to stay true to its working class rebellious roots. But at this point, it's two against one. So Mike Cassell, like an unhappy toddler, starts acting out against Christian Odige and causing problems. From the perspective of everyone who was involved in the company at the time, Mike Cassell would start to create a toxic work environment and instigate drama with Odigier, much like he did with Ed Boswell. Unfortunately for Mike Cassell, at that point, Christian Odigier was bringing way more to the table of what Tony Sorensen wanted. Tony Sorensen tries to suggest to Mike Cassell that he should just disengage from the process, go on vacation, and come back when he's ready to reap the success of the work Sorensen and Odigier would put in. According to Sorensen, Cassell doesn't take the olive branch. Instead, he would lean into his old gangster habits of trying to intimidate his way back Back into the picture. For example, one day Tony Sorensen and Mike Cassell are at a restaurant together and Mike Cassell points towards this guy and he's like, do you know who that is? That's Robert Escobar and he'll anybody for 10 grand. I don't care how much of a martial arts champion Tony Sorensen had been. He's still a little Danish boy at heart. He didn't grow up rubbing shoulders with Mexican drug cartels, so he was freaked out. And what does he do? He calls up his lawyers and is like, this man has left me no choice. Let's run Mike Cassell up with that buy-sell clause. A buy-sell clause is the right to sell or buy someone out in a legally binding agreement. Usually you have to get reimbursed for whatever you put in. Mike Cassell had invested nothing into Von Dutch but sweat equity, which I'm assuming had no monetary value. By this point, Sorensen had invested close to $2 million into Von Dutch. So Sorensen tells Mike that he has a two week window to pay him $2 million and get the company or he could pay Sorensen nothing and Sorensen would get full ownership of Von Dutch. According to Sorensen, all that Mike had to say was I'm buying, not selling to keep Von Dutch. He claims to have been fair. Mike knew people and he could have easily raised money. From Mike Cassell's perspective, as a convict, it would have been near impossible for him to raise that kind of capital. Long story short, Mike Cassell wasn't able to meet the deadline and lost everything. Tony Sorensen, on the other hand, is on the precipice of making a killing. With Mike Cassell out of the picture, Sorensen and Odigier are ready to make some money. And the cash cow they'd create would be a little product called the trucker hat. A trucker hat is much like a baseball cap, except that it has a graphic front and a mesh back. It had started becoming popular in the early 2000s, but Von Dutch would really take it to the next level. Mike Cassell claims the idea for the trucker hat was his and not Tony Sorensen's. In fact, in the Hulu documentary, his brother Donald would pull out the receipts, proving that he had made designs years prior that were eerily similar to the final product. Either way, Mike Cassell is out of the picture and Sorensen is the one with the prototype in his hands and he sees big bucks. In this prototype, Sorensen sees a premium product that could be sold for as much as $85. But for the product to be that expensive, it would need to be perceived as a covetable luxury. One of the only ways of doing that would be for it to be placed in the hands of a covetable, luxurious crop of people. The relationship between celebrities and brands can be a very harmonious one. As Tony Sorensen explained, in the Hulu documentary, brands help celebrities look cool and celebrities help brands sell their products. 
The issue with celebrities typically is gaining access to them and building trust. But Christian Odige had seen that kind of potential in a young man he met called Tracy Mills. Tracy Mills was a young LA-based creative who was heavily involved and connected in celebrity circles thanks to his brother Chris Mills. Chris Mills was an NBA player and the owner of a company called 310 Motors which served a celebrity clientele. Through working at 310 Motors, Tracy Mills gained the trust of power players in Hollywood and eventually these people would come to Tracy to find out what was cool. Once Tracy Mills got hired by Von Dutch, from a fashion perspective at least, he had somewhere to bring them. From my perspective, and I would love to know what you think, it would be the product placement magic facilitated by the connections of Tracy Mills that would really make Von Dutch go boom. And the dynamic was a simple one. Celebrities would come to the Von Dutch store and Von Dutch would give them whatever they wanted and often for free. The next thing you know, these celebrities are seen with the product everywhere. Von Dutch products would become a central feature of the hit reality television show The Simple Life featuring Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie. Paris Hilton for a hot second is seen in nothing but Von Dutch. Ashton Kutcher is spotted courtside at a Lakers game wearing the cap. It would also make an appearance in his hit reality television show called Punked on MTV. Justin Timberlake is wearing it. Britney Spears is wearing it. Dennis Rodman is wearing it. Within six months, the brand goes from minus $1 million $65,200 in sales to $150 million. And every month, the figure keeps doubling. The success is truly astounding. And the Von Dutch team makes sure to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Luxury cars, private jets, lavish parties. Christian Odige becomes a bit of a celebrity in his own right. In a really poignant moment of the Hulu documentary, Tony Sorensen goes, Quote, imagine creating a product that everyone wants. End quote. In the early 2000s, and for a short but magic moment, that's exactly what Von Dutch did. They created a brand and they created a product that everyone fervently wanted a piece of. And eventually, that would become a huge problem. At its peak, Von Dutch had generated north of $400 million in sales. But the counterfeit market was north of a billion dollars. In fact, Von Dutch became became the second most counterfeited brand in the world after Louis Vuitton. As the film points out, one of the weaknesses of logo-driven brands is that you can literally slap a logo on anything, including a Fruit of the Loom t-shirt. And also, when everybody gets a piece of something, the illusion of exclusivity fades. Tony Sorensen smells the beginning of a threat of market oversaturation. But all that Christian Odige sees is a demand that he needs to meet at any cost. This creates a rift between the two men. At the time, the cost of meeting this insatiable demand would be threefold. The prices would rise, Von Dutch would start cutting corners quality-wise, and simultaneously they'd start making licensing and distribution deals that conflicted with the brand's original identity. They'd start making stuff like kids' clothing and energy drinks, kind of like all gas, no brakes. Niels Jules would also come to find out that Christian Odige was defrauding the company by bumping the price of products by $2 and pocketing the difference. Is it? If you bump the price up and you skim off the top, is that bump? Is that pocketing the difference or is that pocketing the, sur the surplus? Let me know. Let me know what the proper term is. I'm not an accountant. I don't know. So from 2003 to 2004, everything including the sales of Von Dutch, start to self-implode. The original target market of Von Dutch, the hot rod community, started parodying the product. They make knockoff t-shirts with eyeball logos and the words no respect on them. The celebrity community disowns the brand. Paris Hilton gives away all her clothes and it becomes clear to everyone, including Christian Odige, that in order to survive, the brand would need to go back to its roots somehow. Mike Cassell would come to mind, but by this point, he's bitter, struggling to survive and slipping back into the underworld. In fact, around the time Odige tried to court Mike Cassell back to Von Dutch, Cassell would send Escobar's people to intimidate Sorensen into taking $500,000 cash in exchange for walking away from the company or or else. Tony Sorensen would get the DA involved and Mike Cassell sabotages that opportunity. Bobby Vaughn is also not an option because his life is falling apart. The toxicity of his codependent relationship with Mark Rivas would actually result in him murdering Mark Rivas out of self-defense following a violent fight. Bobby Vaughn debates 
protect himself, but instead turns himself into the police and is facing 70 years and two lives for a total of 270 years in prison for charges of first degree murder and attempted murder. He'd eventually be found not guilty on all charges, but while he's fighting the case, Vaughn is off the table. And funny enough, right when Vaughn Dutch is already weakened, someone from the past would make a reappearance and really put a nail in the brand's coffin. When a brand's public profile is high, people naturally get curious and start doing some digging. One day in 2004, Fox News would head over to the Von Dutch offices and catch Tony Sorensen off guard by asking him some weirdly pointed questions about Von Dutch's history. It turns out that some Orange County news outlet had gotten its hands on a letter Kenneth Von Dutch had allegedly written shortly before he passed away from complications related to alcoholism. The letter was filled with racist, bigoted ideologies and exposed him as a not see sympathizer. The letter read, I am not willing to go through it anymore only to emerge in a place full of ends and Mexicans and Jews out of control of those unforementioned. I don't know that word. I have always been a Nazi and still believe it was the last time the world had a chance of being operated with a logic. What a shame. So many Americans died and suffered to make the rich richer to save England and France again. Or was that still? I hope you lying wieners get swallowed up with your stupidity, what kind of a fucked up world I have to get well for? <laughs> Bye. Heil. <laughs> what the f So when the Von Dutch team would do their own digging to try and figure out the letter's origins and who had co-signed its legitimacy, guess whose name came up? Ed Boswell. In the Hulu documentary, Ed Boswell goes, I had a master license on Von Dutch and was supposed to be paid 1%, but they refused to pay me. So when there were a few interviews with me, I said, yeah, he did have some Nazi leanings. Hail Von Dutch. Bye. So this would initiate a big PR crisis that is described in the film as an early iteration of cancel culture. People start boycotting the brand. They need to recall products. Sorensen has to go on the defense being like, no, no, we're not racist. And uh, it was all downhill into obsolescence from there. Tony Sorensen would end up selling the company in 2008 for an undisclosed amount. Christian ODJ would leave the brand in 2007, poaching Tracy Mills and start the fashion brand Ed Hardy. ODJ passed away in 2015 at the age of 50 from cancer. Mike Cassell would be left sick, poor, and addicted to all kinds of stuff. Ed Boswell, despite getting his revenge, would still be left bitter. Revenge is not an antidote to pain. And Bobby Vaughn would eventually get a settlement and be officially named one of the original creators of Von Dutch, but he'd choose to dedicate the rest of his life to making amends for the of his friend Mark Revis. And Von Dutch today still exists. In interviews, uh, people representing the brand claim that it's successful and doing better than ever, but seem to refuse to disclose any numbers to the press based on what I was able to find. If I'm wrong, I'll put this up on screen. It is possible that the brand has managed to capitalize off of Y2K nostalgia, but I don't know about you. It just doesn't hit like it used to. And maybe that's because it was never supposed to hit in the hyper-commercialized way it did in the first place. To this day, many people seem to speculate that had Mike Cassell or Bobby Vaughn even stayed at the helm or been involved with Von Dutch, the brand might still be relevant today. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments. And thanks for watching. See you next time.